Um, okay, uh, so hello everybody. Uh, today uh, is modeling and computation seminar uh, via Zoom. And uh, today's speaker is Christopher Kaukas from uh, Department of Cosmetics, uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Uh, he got his PhD uh, at the University of California, Irvine. And today uh, he will talk about um, the, uh, universal differential equations for scientific machine learning. Uh, so, uh, as some people were not able to attend uh, this Zoom meeting, uh, this uh, seminar is recorded. Um, and uh, Chris, do you hear me? Yep, I hear you. Can you hear me well? Yes. All right, just let me know when I should get started. Okay, I think you, you, you can start. So we have some uh, participants, some number of participants here, 26 participants. I think that people in file already uh, logged in. So again, uh, we have Christopher Kaukas from MIT and today he'll talk about differential equations and machine learning. All right, yep. Hello everyone, I'm uh, Christopher Kaukas from the MIT Department of Mathematics. And I'm, uh, the topic today is universal differential equations for scientific machine learning. So let me kind of dive right in with that and start uh, talking about how um, the major advances in machine learning were really due to encoding more structure into the model, right? So you could basically say that machine learning can, in theory, learn to do everything if you have enough data. But what makes machine learning better is if you have more prior structure encoded into the actual model that you're trying to, to learn. And so this is not something that was just done for science. Um, one, one area that was that, where you actually see this before scientific machine learning is actually convolutional neural networks, right? Because what they're doing is they essentially take this information about how a picture works and encodes it into the machine learning model that they're using. So the convolution operation, if you're not familiar with it, really all it's doing is it's taking a big square and it's finding the right way to sum it into a smaller square. Right, so, you, so you can say like, I wanna average all of the points in nine pixels to make a one pixel that's smaller. That'd be one way to be able to downsize a picture, right? Um, so convolution operation is just what are the weights I should have in a local operation, a local stencil, such that I can, down, uh, I can make that smaller in a way that preserves the right information. That, that choice to be using a convolution kernel is basically encoding this idea that most spatial information um, in a picture is local, right? Knowing that, that things are nearby means that they're probably more related. And so it's okay to kind of lose some information by averaging nearby properties, but to average something that is far away, that, that has meaning and that meaning, you know, the, 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 the fact that two pixels are very far away means that they're probably not as related as the ones that are closer, right? So that structural assumption is really what makes convolutional neural networks work. And that's really one of the reasons why, you know, deep learning has really taken off. And so if we want to really utilize the same idea, what we have to do is we have to understand what is the structure of science, right? So that way we can make a machine, form machine learning that encodes the structure of our scientific problems. And then that way we should hopefully see the same similar advances in terms of, you know, the amount of data that's required to get a usable model. And so if we want to look at what the structure of science is, like if you're not familiar with it, a lot of it is in differential equations. So here is a very simple differential equation. It's d bunny dt equals some term for exponential growth in the number of bunnies minus some term that's telling us that, the, that wolves are eating bunnies, right? So if you have more wolves, then you have a larger decrease in the amount of bunnies. If you have less bunnies, then you have a, less, a lower chance that a wolf will be able to find a bunny to eat it and so you don't have as much decrease, right? Similarly, you have uh, the next term, which is the wolf DT equals, well, if there's more food, then you get more wolves, but also your amount of wolves dies off over time due to competition, right? So the structure of these scientific models is really about each term is mechanistic. It's telling you, it's encoding some idea for how the different terms of these models are interacting with each other. Here, this is an ecological model, but the similar models exist, say, in systems biology, in climate models, where each of the terms really has some biophysical meaning. And what you do is you take the structure of the equations, you, you figure out how things interact, 
This defines a differential equation, and then the solution of the differential equation tells you what the emergent behaviors of that system are, right? So if you solve the lock voltaire equations under certain parameters, you will get a cyclic solution like what is seen on the right. And so a lot of, sci a lot of the science uh, structure, right, a lot of the structure that we know about science is really encoded in how we come up with these differential equations, these interaction graphs. And you really begin to see that in, in places like systems biology, where a lot of these experiments in the zebrafish hindbrain, what you do is you, you tag the proteins of the zebrafish hindbrain um, with something called GFP. So that way you can actually see where the proteins are lining up. And from that, you can start taking out proteins from the system. You can put extra in and you can see how they're interacting. And so what biologists do is they create this reaction graph which is shown there on the left, where you can say like, oh, you know, RA enters the cell and then it binds with binding protein. And so you can understand how all these proteins are starting to interact. And from those interactions, you can create large systems of differential equations for your chemical reaction models. And now the reason why this is important is because, you know, there, in some sense, you know that science has a lot of data, right? Science is something that is validated by experiments. But when you go to machine learning, you always want to say, what is the data that I'm going to train on, right? You, from this, from this, these scientific experiments, you don't have, you know, a measure, measurements of thousands or millions or billions of different chemical reactions. You have this aggregated data in terms of structure about how different things are interacting. And then you, what you can get is you can make some new experiments and maybe get, you know, hundreds or thousands of data points. But this is your prior information that you really want to build from, right? It's not some gigantic, you know, uh, it's not always some gigantic database, but it is some structural information about how things interact. And what this, this field of scientific machine learning or scientific AI is really about incorporating this domain modeling, these differential equations with the machine learning that we're doing in order to augment for the fact that we don't have the like, infinite data sources. So re the really key idea to, to see about how to put these together is to really first figure out how machine learning and differential equation modeling are different, right? And it really comes down to the difference between mechanistic and non-mechanistic models. So a model in some sense is just a function, right? So your model takes in the numbers of rabbits today and it spits out the predicted number of rabbits tomorrow. And there, you didn't have to say, okay, how did you come up with that model, right? How did you come up with that mathematical function? One way to do this is with a differential equation, where what you do is you describe your mechanisms or your structure, and then hopefully if you've captured enough of the structure, you will have a system that behaves like the original system, and that should be able to, when you, when you then solve the differential equation, you should then get very similar behavior. And so, for example, uh, the ecological model that we had before had a term that was mechanistic, right, that said, you know, the amount of rabbits changes in proportion to the number of current rabbits because this is, this is exponential growth and, you know, the number of rabbits that we have today is how many mates there will be available, et cetera, et cetera, right? So you, you come up with these mechanistic terms and if you have enough encoded mechanisms in there, then you'll have a model that is close enough to reality such that it makes good predictions. The other side of this is machine learning. And the way to think about machine learning in terms of this idea of modeling is that machine learning is a learnable black box where with the right parameters, it can literally fit any possible nonlinear function. So a neural network is what we'll call a universal approximator, which is a function such that if you pick the right parameters, it can pretty much match any possible nonlinear function. And so um, in some sense, you might want to ask a question of which is better and you might start to think, you know, with all this hype going around machine learning these days that, you know, hey, look, something that can fit every possible function might be a better thing to model with. But that's not actually always the case, though, right? So mechanistic models have a lot of, um, a lot of advantages to them, which is the reason why a lot of people still study them, right? So mechanistic models understand the structure of your problem. It's encoded in your problem what things can interact and what things can't interact. And so things that are unphysical pretty much can't happen in a model, right? So if your differential equation, if you know that it satisfies conservation of energy and conservation of mass, you can change parameters around and not worry about getting an unphysical result. Um, with, a, with a neural network, it can approximate any function, and so therefore it can approximate any function that is 
you know, that is shaped, you know, you, you can have a Hamiltonian that doesn't necessarily have constant energy. And now what does that even mean, right? Um, so the other thing with me mechanistic models is that, is that usually they can extrapolate far beyond the original data because they're getting the correct mechanisms of the problem, right? So, you know, a, the model of gravity with a inverse squared law tended to do pretty well from, you know, you, you understand how it works in the solar system and it gets pretty well with galaxies. You know, it's not perfect. You know, there's some more mechanisms you might need to be starting to learn about as you change scales. But these models tend to have, they, they tend to find out what the core components of the system are, and that makes them have a great extrapolation powers. Um, the other thing is that mechanistic models are interpretable, right? So each of the parameters in there can be identified with a specific idea, right? So the alpha in the Lockable Terra model is the rate at which rabbits are reproducing. So if you want to understand what happens if rabbits are reproducing faster, well, you just change alpha. So this, this interpretability um, means that you can do a lot of really nice mathematics with it. And you can understand what happens in different situations. But the mechanistic model approach, you know, it has these advantages. So it has a lot of the things that you know machine learning can't do, but it's limiting because you actually have to know the mechanism. Um, and that's really where machine learning kind of took up in the first place, right? Because, you know, what would the mechanistic model be for what I should recommend to you next buy from Amazon? Right, it's hard to actually, that idea seems almost impossible, right? How do I come up with such a mechanism? Um, so if you have a model that doesn't require that you know any mechanisms, that's, that's great, right? Because you can just learn it directly from data. And so these non-mechanistic models, on the other hand, they don't have these, these, uh, these advantages, but there are other advantage, that, but they're real advantages. If you don't have a predictive model, you can put that there. And if you have enough data, you can train that, that machine learning mechanism to be the missing model that you didn't know about. All right, so neither is really better than the others. It's really about, they both have strengths and weaknesses. And the interesting piece in, in the intersection here is really to figure out how do we use the advantages of these non-mechanistic models um, to be able to augment our mechanistic modeling approaches. So let's start to mix the two, right? So we can add scientific structure, these differential equations to machine learning. And how do we do that, right? It's easy to say at a high level that we want to do this, but how exactly do we go about doing this? And the key is really to think about neural networks as just the universal approximation theorem, right? So it's not something that works on data. It's not something that you, know, that you use to, to fit problems. A neural network is really just an RN to RM function, which can get epsilon close to any possible RN to RM function. So you can, you know, the universal approximation theorem is a way of being able to really um, mathematize that, right? So you can actually prove this theorem under certain conditions about the functions. But at a high level, you should really just think about it as it's a amorphous blob that can kind of approximate any possible Rn to Rn function if you pick the right parameters. So kind of like a Taylor series, you know, it's, it's this kind of thing that can approximate functions. And so if you think about it as a function approximator, it's a nonlinear function approximator that doesn't seem to have the issues of polynomial approximation, which it, if you know about the, uh, these numerical issues, if you try to do a polynomial approximation over a large space, you tend to have a bunch, um, you know, x to the thousands, thousands power, essentially make small perturbations. Um, it, it drops all your small perturbations because you have these numerical difficulties because you only have 16 digits of accuracy. Right, so neural networks just tend to be a nice nonlinear form for being able to perform any possible you know, nonlinear function approximation. So there, uh, there are other choices that you can choose here. And in some of these cases, I will say that, you know, hey, you could have swapped out a neural network for a Fourier series or a Chebyshev series. Um, the real question is why are neural networks something that people really talk about all the time? And the reason is because neural networks are universal approximators that work well in high dimensions, right? So this is what we could say by neural networks overcome the, the curse of dimensionality. The, in a formal sense, um, overcoming the curse of dimensionality means that the amount of parameters or the size of the neural network grows polynomially with the amount of dimensions. So if you think about using a, another form of a function approximator, like a Fourier series, right? A Fourier series can approximate any, uh, any R to R function that is sufficiently nice. Um, now, if you want to do a R2 to R2 function, 
well, then you can take tensor products of your Fourier basis, right? So you can do sine of kx times uh, sine of jy, right? And you can do every combination of them. But notice that if you want to go then go to three dimensions, four dimensions, five dimensions, if you want to even just take the first, you know, the, the third terms of the Fourier series, you know, that tensor product, the number of terms that you need, is going to grow exponentially with the number of dimensions. Neural networks don't have that property growing exponentially because they don't have a preferred direction, right? So when you're doing tensor products, you're basically saying, I understand how X, Y, Z work, so let me take every combination of X, Y, Z. Neural networks really aren't privileging the, the basic uh, basis. So they tend to do very well in high dimensions, and this is something that a lot of people are still studying. Um, there's really only sparse results right now about how well they actually do in high dimensions, but this is something that from practice we've really figured out. Um, so really the way to think about a neural network is it's not something that works with data. It's just something that if you have a high dimensional function and you don't know what it is, it's a way to represent that high dimensional function in terms of a finite list of parameters. And if you can find those finite list of parameters, then now you have a way to approximate a missing function. Now, the only difficulty with neural networks is that because it can, you know, it can really learn anything in a high dimensional space. It's a hammer that works everywhere. So the pro is that they can approximate anything. And the con is that they can approximate literally anything. And so therefore you need enough data to be able to tell it what the right thing to approximate is. Right? And that's really why neural networks require big data and lots of compute time. Because they're this amorphous sponge and you need to really tell it how every single part of your parameter space, how it should be acting. Because it could be having any possible behavior. So the, the idea here is that neural networks are useful because of how flexible they are. But one of the reasons why they require so much data and compute time is because they might be too flexible for what we actually want to use them for. So what we need to do is we need to constrain how we're using the neural networks such that it's only flexible in the ways that we want to, and hopefully we'd be able to get properties of good properties out. So requiring less compute time, being able to train with less data. And so if the structure of science is differential equations, let's use neural networks inside of differential equations as a way to be able to constrain where we're actually using them. So this is where we come to this idea of the uh, of a universal differential equation. The starting point is the neural ordinary differential equation. Right? So this was found in, in like 1992 as you know, recurrent, they were first called continuous recurrent neural networks, then they were rediscovered as neural ordinary differential equations. This, this first idea is to say, let u prime equals f. We want to find a dynamical system because we know that our physics is defined as a dynamical system. Um, f can be some function that we don't know. Let's just make f a neural network and fit that missing function. Right, and so we can do this. So here's an example of using this diffie q flux uh, code to be able to try to say, oh, if this is the, if this is the data in blue, what is the differential equation that will give you the data? Well, I define this dif the differential equation by a neural network, and then it will iteratively try different parameters in the neural network until it finally finds some that works out well. So here, every single time it runs, it runs, it solves the ODE, it backpropagates through the ODE solver in order to get what the derivative of the neural network parameters are with respect to the loss function against the data, it updates the neural network, and then it runs this again. It keeps on doing this over and over, until it's able to find a neural network that approximate the correct model, right? So this is okay, right? This is already starting to use our information about the fact that, you know, all physics is encoding differential equations. So let's try to find a differential equation instead of trying to find the solution, you know, of the differential equation, because you know that differential equations can have very nice forms, even when their integral has no analytical solution. Right, so this is already moving the problem into a domain that we know is, is what is better posed, but it's not going all the way, right? Because it's not really using any of our physical information about the model. Um, and so the next question is, well, how does, well does this work in practice? And um, so if you did run that, if, you, if I let that animation run forever, you'll see that it will fit. But that's because it has still quite a bit of data, right? It has 30, 40 data points. Um, but it's a, what it was working on was the generating process for that model was not very difficult, right? It was a non-stiff ODE and there was no major spikes. There was no major 
oscillatory behavior. And it will work real well in that case, but without really other information, um, it, th this neural ODE approach doesn't seem to really work well if the problem is, you know, this hard, stiff problems or if you have sparse data. Right? If you just had five data points and told it to learn, train the neural network against it, it'll get you something that will go through those data, data points, but it won't necessarily be able to recreate what other points in the differential equation would have been because it, it won't really figure out enough information about it. But what we can do is we can add domain knowledge to improve the fit. And so what I want to do is I want to walk through if an example step by step um, to be able to showcase how you can add this domain knowledge in this scientific machine learning approach. And what I'm going to use is a uh, model of the COVID-19 outbreak. So this model is a, it has some weird terms in there. So it's not, it's not just an SEIR, it's an SEIR with, um, with some nonlinear terms thrown in there. And what we're going to say is, what I want to do is I want to try to recover that model with only, no, with only imposing domain knowledge that we should know in advance. So we can start out and say, we have this generating process for, for this data. So we have some data about some, some COVID-19 outbreak. And the first thing that we might want to do is say, well, if I have a time series and I want to train something to match the time series, let's take that idea again and let's train a neural ODE, right? We don't know what the differential equation should be. So we make u prime be a neural network and we train the neural network on the data we have. So here what I did was I trained it from the data that was just zero, uh, day zero to day 21, and then asked it, you know, what will the future of the outbreak look like? And while it can fit in the regime that we told it to fit, this it's not really constrained enough to really know the dynamics of, of a epidemiological outbreak. And so it doesn't really extrapolate well, right? Here it doesn't, it doesn't really learn the behavior that it should have, which is that at a, the beginning of an outbreak, you should be exponential, right? It just doesn't learn that it should be making that shift at around the, at around the third week. So what we can do instead is say, well, we, there is a lot that we know about outbreaks, right? I think that most people in, this, in listening to this talk, if I was to tell you, or if I was to ask the question, how long is the incubation period of uh, COVID-19, or, or of the coronavirus, I think most people can answer that, right? How long do, uh, do people generally stay in hospitals? Most people can answer that. And so those are terms of the model that we can then assume that, that we know, right? Because they can be independently verified from different pieces of data. So what I did here, as I said, there is a lot about this SCIR model that we can get correct right off the bat. We know the rate of recovery. We know the rate of infection. You know, we know a lot of these specific terms. So let me define these parts of the ordinary differential equation the thing that we really don't know is the exposure, right? Because exposure is something that is related to how much social distancing people are actually doing, how, what is the policy that, that is being chosen in a given state. It's hard to really know how, how much exposure people are getting to the, to the virus, right? And so the way to think about this then is that I have a differential equation where a lot of these terms are well-defined and I can get these parameter values from alternative data sources, but there are portions of this model that I don't know. And it's those portions in the model that I'll make my, be my unknown known portions. So I'll make those portions, so here the exposure term of the, that changes people from S, the susceptible, to E, the, um, forgetting the, the word right now, uh, but yeah, the exposed, yeah. Um, this exposure rate, is something that we're gonna say, this is a neural network and let's learn what the proper exposure rate would be to put into our model. Now, if we do that, you can see that if you, you know, here in the back end, I actually, you know, saw, I, I, what I did here is I took this, this form of the equation, I trained the neural networks that are embedded within this differential equation against the time series data from zero to 21. And then I did two things. First of all, I looked at, you know, how well is this actually getting the unknown exposure term? And it turns out that if you plot the trained exposure, exposure term against the real exposure term in the generating process, you're actually matching it quite well. The other question that you can ask is, well, you know, did we actually fix this extrapolation problem? And if you look at the bottom right, you can see that, yes, by imposing more structure about the model, you know, imposing more structure about what we know about these epidemiological models, we do get something that extrapolates better. So you get extrapolations that work to about you know, 35 to 40 days when we've only trained to uh, 21 days. That's a lot better than just the naive approach, but it's still not all the way. So is there something else we can do here? 
And so one thing that you can, that one uh, almost completely separate part of the literature that you can look at is this SINDY approach. So SINDY, this is a sparse identification of dynamical systems. Um, Stephen Brunton's done a lot, a lot of really great work in this. And what you, what you can do is you can essentially um, take the inputs to your model and you can apply them, you can apply functions to them in some dictionary. So you can build up some basis that you want to find. You apply, you know, what is my input value? What is my input value squared? What is sine of my input value? What is cosine of my input value? And then you can create this regression problem that is, if I had chosen these coefficients for my basis, and these are the values that would have uh, been calculated out, what is the, what is the best coefficients for my basis that you can have? Right, so this is a sparse regression problem. Now, if you want to do this for just 21 uh, data, data points, uh, it doesn't really turn out to do that well. Right? The sparse regression kind of needs quite a bit of data to work out. And so this is an approach that you can think of. And in some cases, this will work well. In other cases, it doesn't work at, out as well. But this is a, but we can also look at this as this general approach can be combined with this uh, universal ODA approach. Right? So what I did next was I said, well, we have this unknown function inside of the, inside of the ODE, and we have a process for turning unknown, uh, turning time series values back into sparsified functions. What I did then is I, is I performed the Cindy not on the entire ODE itself, but just on this unknown portion, right? Because I can generate input output pairs where I'm putting data into the neural network, seeing what comes out of it. And then I just do this for a lot of data points and then you know, perform the sparse regression and say, what is the function that best approximates the neural network? And it turns out that what it finds is, it finds something that is dependent, a linear term in I. So it says, you know, that's the term that you would, rec that's the term that you would expect to see from an SEIR model. But then there's some uh, other nonlinear terms that it's found. And then what, what you do is we can replace this unknown portion then with the found sparsified model. And it turns out that that is something that extrapolates much better. Right. Why is it something that extrapolates much better? Well, because it has the right exponential properties that you'd expect out of these, um, out, out of these ex, uh, epidemiological models. Right. So it's, this universal ODE approach is really not just trying to do you know, one of these techniques in isolation. It's really about using these ideas together. This, this, there's this one idea that you know, a, neural OD, a neural network is approximating missing functions, and you combine that with the idea that sparse forms tend to perform better with extrapolation. And so what you do is you kind of mix the two ideas together where you train a neural network for the missing terms of your model, you sparse identify these missing terms, and now you have a new mechanistic model, and you can use this, this new mechanistic model um, directly for giving you predictions. Right? And the other thing that, that Chris, happens Chris, is- Chris, it's, it's Misha Chertkov. Can I ask you a question right away? Uh, yeah, yeah. To pre previous slide. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah, so what you discover is there's this uh, sort of the term, which basically means that, uh, well, I guess two infected meet one uninfected, and then it, it spurs uh, basically this uh, change, which doesn't have any uh, physical or, well, for that matter, uh, well, application sense. Uh, why, uh, well, uh, any comment on that? Yeah, so. Um there, there is something that it finds here in terms of the application. That's what I was going to mention here next. That you know, you can when, once you've brought it down to mechanistic terms, you can go look at your terms, and since they're mechanistic, you have to verify that those terms are scientifically plausible, right? Um, one of the interesting things about this model is that it has a different part uh, compartment. So not everyone is just I infected. You also have D people who are severely infected and had to go to the hospital. And what this model finds is that your exposure, you know, I, I allowed the exposure to be a function of three terms. And you'll notice that U3 doesn't show up in here at all. And that's because it found that the exposure term is not dependent on the amount of people who go to the hospital. It really says that if you have such a severe case that you've kind of self-isolated, then that actually doesn't seem to be matter, you know, the, that, that size of that population doesn't seem to be the population that is actually causing exposure. Um, and, and so it's by do, performing the sparse identification process, it really is kind of giving you things that are some, some uh, predictions about what are physical properties that you can then double check and, and figure out whether it's a realistic uh, prediction. It, does that answer your question? Kind of, thank you. 
Yeah, so then I, I think that the, the main thing about this process and the way that we're using this in, in practice in pharmacological, um, in, in pharmacological use cases is once you've predicted a new model, I think that the next thing that you do is that tells you what new data you should be looking for. Right, so in this in this uh, in this small example, um, it makes this it makes this prediction that the amount of exposure is not related to the amount of people who are actually having to go to the hospital because of um, because of the outbreak. And so that is something that we can try to then isolate and then figure out is is that an assumption that makes sense? And that's so it's really guiding us in this model building process. And so this is really the general approach, the overview that we're going to be taking in this next few applications that I walk through. Um, so you, you can do this in a lot of different cases. So in, here I had the ground truth model be a local Volterra equation. And what I did was I said, well, let's assume that we only know that the amount of, of rabbits is growing exponentially and the number of wolves, the, will the wolves die off uh, with the exponential decay. So the other terms in the model are just unknown. We'll make, the, we'll make this be a missing neural network we train a neural network from the missing terms. We do this sparse identification. And what it's actually able to find in this case is it's able to recover that you're missing a quadratic term. And so even though you, you can train on just data from zero of t equals zero to three, if you extrapolate it out, because it has learned that there's a missing quadratic term in your model, then it's able to recover that, yes, there it is supposed to be cyclic in the future, and then it's able to recover this. So um, this, uh, just, just so everyone knows, you can find this code on GitHub. I'll make sure to post the link here. This exact example um, also has, so th these are all done in Julia, but this exact example has been replicated now in, um, in a TensorFlow notebook as well. Um, so the ODEs are simple. Um, I don't think that it really impresses anyone to you know, make sure that you can do things well on ODEs. So let's start moving to more difficult equations and figure out how this combination of structure with uh, these machine learning approaches can really be used on stiffer or larger problems. So the first one to look at is uh, partial differential equations. And there's actually a very strong connection between partial differential equations and convolutions. So it turns out, so on the left, I show this image of a convolution, which is you have these weights. Those weights are in, in red. And what you do is at a center point, you calculate the value of, of the points around you multiplied by the weights. So at the top left, it was doing you know, one times one plus zero times one, et cetera. If you, if you look at that image long enough, you'll be able to see how that summation is working out. It turns out that that's equivalent to what happens with the PDE discretization. So if you write out what the second derivative approximation is, you'd write out one of these equations that says something like, you, know, you take a value from the left, you take a value from the right, you take a value from the top, a value from the bottom, you subtract out four from the middle, and that is that is a, a second-order discretization of the second of the second derivative. Um, so it turns out that the these PDE stencils that you have, they're actually convolution operations with very specific weights. So this is saying that the diffusion operation, the, uh, the Laplacian in two dimensions, is the convolution operation with weights zero, one, zero, one minus four, one, zero, one, zero. And so we can use this idea to be able to mix it with this training process to be able to back out what the, what the PD operator should have been given what we've trained. And an example of this is where we look at the Fisher KPP equations, where what we say, you know, there's some truth equation in the background, which is rho sub t equals a quadratic term plus d times a diffusion term, right? What we do is we, what we did was we generated data from this. And then we said, could we recover this partial differential equation? So what we used to recover it is we had a, a standard neural network, which is an R to R, just an R to R function um, that is locally applied. And then we added to it a convolution operation, which is performing the convolution along space. Right? And when we train this universal partial differential equation, what it learns is that the weights of this convolutional neural network, they need to add to one. Uh, or they need to add to zero, which is something that's required for any conservative operator. And then the other thing that it learns is that the weight of the convolution on the left equals the weight of the convolution of the, on the right, which if you can see from the diffusion is something that has to be true because that just means that you don't, that means that your, your particles are moving symmetrically, right? You don't have advective flow, so it's not moving on average in one direction. And so this convolution operation is picking up that there should be, that. Uh, part of this PDE is defined by a diffusion 
And then the neural network is learning the missing, missing nonlinear function, which you can see in part D over there is a quadratic function, right? And then you can perform as the Cindy approach on, the, on this neural network and directly recover that the partial differential equation was generated, the, the data was generated by a partial differential equation where it had a diffusion term and a quadratic term. So we can even do this on uh, other systems. So here's an example of uh, learning a stochastic differential equation. So a stochastic differential equation is an ordinary differential equation where you have added Brownian motion terms. And here our data was, what is the variance and what is the mean and the variance along the time series? And it's able to learn how it should be changing both the drift and diffusion functions simultaneously, such that it's able to match both the first order and second order effects of the stochastic system. And so uh, we, we can keep on going down this route of saying, of showcasing how you can use this for equation discovery. But I think that I now I wanna pivot to showing that you can use this in a completely different way as well. So one way, one completely different way you can use this approach is inside of scientific simulators to uh, try to accelerate them in specific ways. So what do I mean by this? Let's take, um, let's take the, uh, a version of the Navier-Stokes equations and this is, this is a form, uh, when I talk to uh, these climate scientists, they refer to it as the Boston-esque equations. And it's used as, a, it's used as the, um, the small squares inside of these climate models. And now we wish we could actually solve one of these Boston-esque equations at every single point in space along the Earth, but it turns out that's completely impractical. So what, what you have to do in order to make this problem practical is you have to turn it into a one-dimensional approximation because you really only care about what is the, uh, in each voxel, inside of each box, you really just care about what is the temperature along the z-axis. So as you go up and down in the ocean, what is the temperature inside of this giant box? So what you can do is you can take the integral along the x and y of these equations and you can get a, a different form of your PDE, right? So you can basically rewrite this PDE, this three-dimensional PDE as a one-dimensional partial differential equation, which captures the same behavior in the z-axis. The only problem with that approach is that um, the partial differential equation that you get out, this one-dimensional PDE, has an unknown function. That unknown function is defined by its own PDE, which itself has an unknown function is defined by its own PD. And so there's actually an infinite cascade of, of one-dimensional PDEs that you have to solve in order to recover fully the behavior of the three-dimensional PDE. But here again, this is a similar type of problem, right? So this is known as the parameterization problem, which people have been having to solve by hand for a very long time. But instead what we can do is we can say, well, we have data for temperature along the z-axis at a given part of the world, can we figure out what this, what this missing function should be such that we have this approximating form work? Well, this is just another one of these universal partial differential equation um, as, uh, estimation problems where now we replace the missing function with the neural network. We train the neural network such that it's able to match the same uh, behaviors. And now we have something that can act like the three-dimensional PDE along one axis where we're actually just solving now a one-dimensional PDE in, in terms of a one-dimensional PDE with an embedded neural network. And that, if you, if you look at the difference between um, the times, solving that one-dimensional PDE with a neural network in it is about 15,000 times faster than solving the three-dimensional PDE because I think three-dimensional PDEs are just hard, right? And so this is really show, showcasing that you can use this approach of embedding neural networks to be able to solve problems that, you know, before people really had to come up with these parameterizations by hand, and they were, you, you can find full papers where people are trying to figure out what a good function approximator is. And now you can say, well, if I just have the data, I can stick a neural network in there and figure out what that, that, um, that missing parameterization is automatically. And you can also use this to be able to find a closure equation. So here is a, here is a test model where we were looking at a non-Newtonian fluid. It was defined by a set of uh, six, uh, six DAEs, so six differential algebraic equations, but we want to be able to approximate this in a way such that we can look at what happens when we change certain physical properties of the model and, we then, uh, and then be able to simulate it really fast. Right? So what we did was we approximated the, the six DAEs by two or ordinary differential equations with neural networks, and it's what it's able to do is it's able to 
train the neural network to be not just a function of, um, of the current state, but also be a function of the physical parameters. So we trained it on one set of physical parameters, and then we asked it, how well can it predict at other physical parameters? And then the, the plot B that you see there is how it's able to predict, it, how well it's able to match the true solution on other physical parameters, right? So it's able to interpolate in this space and tell us what an approximating set of two ODEs will do well, given the original six DAEs that we wanted to uh, learn. And so this is another approach that's able to perform an acceleration um, in this case, you only get a 2x acceleration, but it really showcases that, you know, you can perform this acceleration on large PDE problems, but you can also do this on smaller DAE problems as well. A very, a very different case, um, that, which seems to be in the same realm, is solving thousand-dimensional partial differential equations. So, uh, a lot of really nice work by um, E. Wynan and, and Jansen and such have shown that these very large high dimensional partial differential equations that you see from Hamilton Jacobi Bellman equations and Black Scholes, they can be solved by using recurrent neural networks. Um, and the way they, that they did this was they noted that this, this, P, partial, this parabolic PDE form can be transformed into a backwards STE. And this backwards STE is really a discretization that is missing some functions, right? So there's this term in there, this sigma, the sigma transpose time, uh, times the grad u, which is a term that, you know, in, in the analysis, you can prove that there exists this term such that the BSD has a well-posed solution. Um, but in practice, you don't really necessarily know what that term is without solving the equation. So instead, what you can do is you can do an inverse approach where you say, this is a function I don't know about, replace it with a neural network. Now, the, when you do this proof of the analytical properties of this BSD, you know that the BSD at its very end has to, or at its, at its initial condition, has to be equal to the, um, the forward process of the STE at its very end. And so you have a condition that has to be satisfied analytically what, for, uh, for whether you, basically you know whether you have the correct function, because when you have the correct function, this analytical property must be satisfied. So what you can do is you can make uh, the difference from how well satisfied that analytical property is as your loss function, and then train your neural network to find the missing function, right? And so their approach was, well, you can come up with a, with a recurrent neural network that will give you about the same properties, but if you can also think about it instead in terms of this universal ODE approach, where you can say this function inside of the differential equation, you know, when we, when we stack the two, um, to be able to give you the forward process and the reverse process simultaneously, this missing term can be replaced by a neural network. And then what this means is that you can take a differentiable stochastic differential equation solver and then train the neural network in this context. And that will also give you the solution. Uh, those, this will also give you a way to be able to solve 100 dimensional or 1000 dimensional partial differential equations. If you <laughs> make if you use yeah. the Euler Mariama discretization on this problem, you recover the same exact uh, model, uh, the same exact model that they had with the recurrent neural network, but then if uh, but then by using it in this approach, you then automatically get, for example, higher order methods and adaptivity and the ability to solve stiff equations because now you're using all the tools available from an existing SDE solver. Yeah, there's could, a question. Please, can can I ask a question? It's me, yeah. again. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, so, uh, well, uh, uh, again, back, back, back one slide. Uh, yeah. uh, you, you're contrasting, uh, well, uh, let's say, Hamilton Jacobi and respective stochastic uh, version. And then you are saying that in a stochastic version, uh, well, stochastic ODE of a certain type, maybe with mean field, uh, you, um, uh, you are learning some parameters within the stochastic ODE. Why cannot you do it in a PD itself? So there are two, two ways of doing it, right? So why stochastic uh, ODE, so ODE versus PD, uh, why it is better in this case? Yeah, so in, in this case, the partial differential equation, if it's a thousand dimensional, then you have a very high dimensional function that you have to learn. Uh, you could make that a neural network and you can train that neural network, that's one approach. But this transformation to a backwards SDE it gives you a stochastic differential equation, which the number of STEs is equal to the number, the dimension of the PDE, which can be a lot more tractable, right? Solving a thousand dimensional PDE 
can be a very difficult problem, but solving a, a, a system of a thousand SDEs is much simpler. I see. So you're basically saying that the structure which you have in this stochastic ODE is much lower dimensional and uh, uh, so that's, that's your guess about what is behind uh, this dynamics. Got it. Thank you. Yeah, and I think that th this this general approach is one that I'm, I'm think that there's a lot more ideas to, that can be explored here because I think that another case where this shows up, or I haven't looked at it, and I don't know if anyone's looked at it. Um, an, an, a, one thing that you might want to think about is, um, you know, one way to solve PDEs is to find the Green's function, right? Like you can prove a lot of really nice things about Green's functions, and in in the same sense, you can say, well, if I can figure out what the Green's function is, then I can you know, take, just take convolutions of it and now have a fast way to solve lots of PDEs. And, and then what you can do is you can say, well, if I don't know the Green's function, I make it a neural network. And that gives me to be able to transform PDEs to Green's functions and then use the, all my Green's functions machinery to, to maybe solve it a little faster, right? In this case, there's this transformation between uh, these parabolic PDEs and backwards SDEs, which is known. It's just there's an unknown function that needs to be found out in order to make that transformation work. But if you ever can do this, then it's a lot more efficient to just directly use the backwards SDE. So yeah, I, I think this idea of performing transformations between analytical spaces where you know different, where you have different tools is a very nice um, thing that we, we're gonna be exploring a lot more of. Um, but the, another way that you can go about doing this is you can start wrapping neural networks around physical simulators as well. So one case that, that I was looking at with this was, um, if you take the lock voltaire equations, right, this is my favorite model to just kind of throw problems at, um, could you solve this, this given problem? So if you give me a gamma, an alpha and a delta, can I give you back a beta and a gamma such that the solution always stays between zero and six? In theory, this is a problem that would be very difficult to analyze by hand, but in practice, it should be a very low dimensional decision space, right, because you're really, there, it, it, bifurcations of these dynamical systems are always very low dimensional. And in some sense, this is a bifurcation between one set of behaviors to another set of behaviors. So you might assume that it's also very simple, but you just don't know how to solve for it. But what we can do is we can just train this neural network that, you know, it's an R2 to R2 uh, function, which it takes in the two parameters that you know, it spits out a guess of what the other two parameters are. And the cost function is you put all four parameters into your ODE solver, and then, um, and then check whether you satisfy the condition or not. And so if we train this neural network such that, it, um, such that its loss function is low, what that means is it gets a very high chance of giving you two parameters that will then satisfy the condition. And so it turns out that we can make this be, you know, when we, when we do this for a training data, I think of, uh, of um, 10,000 points, and then we do 2,000 tests, we saw that there was one point that, that it didn't get correct, but, because what we're actually trying to learn is the behavior of a simulator itself, we can just take more data points around that portion where it ended up training, uh, training poorly, and then add that to our data set until we're able to get essentially you know, every, everything correct. Um, so the, the interesting thing here, right, is we're, what we're learning, we're, we're learning an R2 to R2 function, which is the solution to the inverse problem. And the, and our data set is really, we can always just generate new solutions to the inverse problem to be able to, um, to be able to train the neural network to be able to be as accurate as possible in the parameter regions we need. Now, this itself is not a way that directly accelerates the simulations at, as a whole, right? Because in order to be able to perform this process, I need to be able to solve many, many inverse problems. But what it does instead is it gives you a way to be able to pre-compute the solution to inverse problems such that now you have a real-time way of being able to solve it, right? Because this, this problem of given a alpha and a delta, give me the beta and gamma such that the solution stays in zero and six, you could perform an optimization every single time. But now that we've performed this optimization enough times to be able to train a neural network, now you just take the two values, you put it through a neural network and you get the solution for what the other two are and so this has turned a problem, which it can be a difficult inverse problem, into something that can be pre-computed so that way we can solve it in real time. And one way to be able to showcase this was we took a partial differential equation, like greer meinhardt equations, which is one of these equations where under certain conditions, you can have Turing patterning show up. So for some cases, for some parameters, you get spots. For other cases, you just have a homogeneous solution. 
And what we'd want to do is we want to figure out um, if you give me three parameters, can I tell you the other three parameters such that you have a non-homogeneous solution? And so solving this PDE inverse problem of it requires that you solve the full PDE and then you try other parameters, right? It could be a very difficult problem to solve, but once we've trained this neural network, we can now do this in real time, right? So it's, it's really about moving the, the portion of computation such that we can turn difficult problems that involve simulations into something that can now be real time by having a neural network be the RM to RM function that is directly the solution of the inverse problem. And so this, what, what this is really showcasing is that there's a lot of different um, applications that can come up if you can efficiently train neural networks embedded in differential equations and differential equations embedded in neural networks. And so the packages that we built up to be able to do this type of uh, machinery, they're all built within this Julia programming language. But the key that, that I've been showcasing here is this diffiqflux.jl where it's able to handle ordinary differential equations, stochastic differential equations, stochastic delay differential equations, differential algebraic equations, delayed, there's the whole list. And essentially what it's able to do is it's able to allow you to put neural networks in your differential equation and around your differential equation. And then whenever you have an ODE solve or a differential equation solve, it replaces that solve with adjoint methods within the back pass to be able to give you a fast gradient calculation. Um, and what we've been doing in the last uh, few months or so is really scaling this up so that way we can tackle these difficult la large PDE problems and very non-stiff problems. And so one way to showcase that is to showcase a simple piece of code. Or what this is doing is it is telling the training loop to use a high order adaptive implicit ODE solver with matrix free Newton Krylov methods with preconditioned GM. You know, basically all those buzzwords that you have to have if you want to solve a large PDE problem are all working in conjunction with this training process. And if you want to learn more about that, you can take a look at one of these tutorials that we have in the differential equation such a library, which goes through how do you use the automatic sparsity detection, uh, precondition, uh, precondition Jacobian free Newton Krylov. It goes through how you use all these components. And essentially this whole library is differential, it's neural network compatible. So if you just utilize it as normal, but you throw neural networks in places, then it's able to just train the neural network within this, this code. Um, and so one of the questions that really comes up when, when we say this is, you know, how do you build a stack such that it's all able to be composed with neural networks um, without having, without actually making it directly use the tools of the machine learning package? And so the way that we did this with is this, what I call the science of code generation. Um, so the Julia programming language, it's a lot like MATLAB, Python, or R. And except it's known for being fast, right? I, I, well, the, that being fast is its claim to fame. I think that for a mathematician, it's much more interesting to understand why it's fast and how to use that to be able to solve other mathematical problems. Um, so what we did was we basically start with differential equations at JL, right? It's this, it's this differential equation library that I discussed, which has you know, I'm ex, you know, implicit explicit methods, exponential integrators, symplectic integrators, and has this huge tool set that we want to be able to compose with neural networks because there's no way we're ever going to be able to rewrite every little piece into TensorFlow, right? So how do we make these things automatically bind together with the neural network library? What we did was we used code generation to generate these uh, arbitrary changes in the back propagation codes. Um, the way that this, that this looks is we can formalize it by talking about metaprograms. So A of x, y given t is a generic algorithm. And what we mean by that is essentially when I say that 2x, 2x plus y squared you know, is, a mathematical is a mathematical equation, you know in your heart that that doesn't have a meaning until I tell you what set x and y come from, right? Because if x is irrational, that means something slightly different than if x is a real number. But in some sense, that, that, that phrase, 2x plus y squared, exists as some generic idea where, which is independent of the set that, we're, that, two, that x and y come from, right? And so a generic algorithm is really taking that, that difference to heart, where you say, I can write down 2x plus y squared, but the algorithm doesn't have a meaning until I tell it what type t x and y are. And so by default, this is actually how Julia works in the back end to create, be able to do its code generation in a, in a way that builds fast code. Right? So if you write down a function f of x, y, 
it basically gives you a templated function, which is non-instantiated until you tell it what the types are. And then you can see on the right here that if you give it uh, float64 types, it is different than, it generates different code than if you give it uh, float32 types. And so this is actually what we can use in our code generation process to be able to tell it to automatically build back passes and to do this code injection so that way the neural network libraries are directly calling the adjoints we want uh, on the fly. And to understand how you get there, um, I want to do a small, small introduction to automatic differentiation where you, you know essentially that numerical differentiation is always going to give you uh, numerically bad results, right? Because essentially what you're doing is if you're subtracting two numbers that are very close to each other, dividing by a very small number, and it's going to give you some very bad numerical precision. So an early idea was to not not perform, so an early idea was to use the complex uh, plane as a way to avoid this, this numerical issue. So if your f is a real valued function and you want to take the real value derivative with respect to x, it turns out that one thing that you could do is you can take a small perturbation, not in terms of uh, the real line, but you take the small perturbation in into the imaginary play uh, plane, you divide by a small number, you take the imaginary part, if you, if you check it, with a Taylor series, you can see that this is actually equivalent to the, fir uh, the first derivative. Well, it's an approximation of the first derivative. Now, the difference of doing this versus numerical differentiation is that, um, you know, when you do numerical differentiation, you're moving, you're subtracting a small real value by a small real value. You see here that your small values are all in the complex plane, and your large values are kept in the real in the real space, and so you don't have that interaction that usually would make you lose digits. And so the, the idea behind at least forward mode automatic differentiation is that you can create a, a large dimensional space for your numbers such that your perturbations are happening in a different location of the floating point number than the original calculation. You can do this with something called a dual number where you can say x, equal, x equals a plus uh, b epsilon where whenever uh, where epsilon squared equals zero. And then if you let f of x equal f of the value, the a part, plus f prime of a times b, the way that epsilon part is the derivative and this definition is pushing along the derivative according to the chain rule. So if you actually look at what happened if you define these rules, then, um, then you know, for example, if you add two dual numbers, what, what happens is you get this, the addition of the, of the two value parts and you recover the addition rule of the derivative. If you multiply two dual numbers, then you get the value part and the derivative of this operation is the product rule, right? So if you do this on a lot of cases, you can probably convince yourself that you know, this truly is recovering um, the correct derivative, and you, you can show this more, more generally. Um, but the idea is that you know, here we found an arithmetic that not only computes the value, but it computes the value and the derivative simultaneously. So if we can just recompile our whole program to be instead of doing standard arithmetic, just recompile it to do dual number arithmetic, then now we're suddenly uh, we're calculating the derivative simultaneously. And so there's this way of being able to do this code uh, generation process um, where if you make it work on a whole language instead of on some uh, machine learning subset of a language, then you can take entire libraries like differential equations jl and then simultaneously just mix them with the neural network library. And then this code generation process will just be building back uh, pack passes wherever they need to be. And so composing uh, with machine learning is actually just one part, a small part of the story. Uh, what I want to end with is by showcasing that these ideas of, you know, you, these ideas for machine learning that we've been using, these neural networks and um, co-generation processes for automatic differentiation, they can actually be used to come up with a lot of other mathematical algorithms. And I think that this is a, this is a direction we'll be pursuing a lot more of in the future. So I want to just kind of showcase a few interesting results. Um, one thing that, that came up was, uh, was that someone created this new number type that performed a uncertainty quantification, or it pushed forward the uncertainty of a variable. And when you put this into the ODE solver, it just generated a new code that was performing, uh, it was, that was able to perform uncertainty quantification without having to do sampling. Um, and so it's actually a code that generated itself. You know, one, I wrote the differential equation solver, someone else wrote the number, they wrote the number type that does the algebra. 
And then by using this code generation process, it generated a new ODE solver that did this uncertainty quantification algebra that then performed this arithmetic. So what, what does that actually look like? Well, what you can do is you can assume that your numbers are essentially a normal distribution, right? So they're random variables with a normal distribution, so they have a mean and a variance. And then you can take a, do a Taylor series approximation of any nonlinear function to be able to say, well, if I was to apply this nonlinear function to, an, to a normal distribution, what is the best approximating normal distribution that would come out? And so you can define what would happen for all your different primitive functions on this number type. And then this gives you an algebra on the numbers, which you, if you then recompile your whole ODE solver to perform this algebra, then now it's performing this linear error propagation. So you might, you might know the basics of this linear error propagation because um, this is actually equivalent to what you're taught in physics classes with the uh, you know, x plus or minus y. It's just more generalized to understand you know, what is, uh, if you were to put x plus or minus y into the L gamma function, what should the best normal approximation be? Right. And so showcasing what this looks like, um, you, can, you, can take, uh, you can have the parameters of your differential equation be something like, 9.79 plus or minus 0 0.02, right? So you have some uncertainty in your gravitational constant. You have uncertainty in the length of the pendulum. You utilize the ODE solver as normal, and it will recompile to internally just do this error propagation arithmetic. And so then the solution that comes out will be a solution with error propagation. And so it automatically knows how to plot itself. So it, when you plot a number with error, it puts the error bars around it. And if you were to perform the same uncertainty quantification, on the analytical solution to the pendulum, you get not only the same values, but the same uh, error bars. So this is really showing that, you know, this idea from, uh, from automatic differentiation of how to propagate through derivatives of programs can really be applied more generally to other problems, like how do you propagate uncertainties, right? So it's, it's really saying that we, this isn't something we should be doing by hand, but it's really, if we can understand how each step of a program should be changing so to be able to, in aggregate, perform this operation, then hard problems like uncertainty propagation can be solved with just you know, one ODE solve because they're, they're doing this, the correct thing at each step. Another interesting example that we found in this space is automatic building of PDE solvers from ODE solvers. So you know, from your Sobolev function space theory, you might know that you can represent L2 functions as, uh, as you know, these vectors in, in a function space, right? Um, so uh, L2 is a Bonnock space, which means that you can, you functions in this Bonnock space are, are really just uh, vectors in some sense. So one way to be able to, to really see this, if you, ha if you haven't seen this before, is um, the Fourier decomposition is one way to do this. Right? So if you take f of x, you can rewrite f of x in terms of a constant term, and then in terms of, uh, in terms of terms that are multiplying signs and cosines, right? And one way to represent f of x as an L2 function then is that it's an infinite length vector of these coefficients for its 4A decomposition. Now, uh, you can define an arithmetic on this space, right? So you can say, what is f of x plus g of x? Well, that's, that's a valid L2 function itself. How would you calculate that function uh, in terms of the coefficients? Well, you just add the coefficients, right? What is f of x times g of x? Well, you have to figure out how you'd multiply coefficients, but you can come up with an algebra on the, way, on the representation of functions in this vector space. Right? And now there's a, there's a theory that says that this is actually a well-defined way to think about PDEs. So semi-group theory is this theory of saying, you know, you, an ODE defined on variables from a, from a Bonnock space, um, you know, like, like this, these function spaces, um, that's another way to represent PDEs, and you can prove the existence of uni uniqueness by using these methods. But now what we want to do is I want to computationally use this idea, right? Because here I have a way to be able to define functions as, you know, as these scalars or vectors in this vector space. And so if I take an existing ODE solver and just make it do this arithmetic, then it should be able to generate pseudospectral codes. And, what we, and this is what you do. Um, so we took this approxfund.jl library, which has, it's a lot like a Sheb fund. So essentially it's able to take a function and, and turn it into a vector and that, ha that is imbued with this algebraic properties. If you then take this, uh, this, this vector form of the function and you define an ODE on it, here this ODE, which is the second derivative, right? So the heat equation, if you, if you take that type that defines the function and you stick into the ODE solver, 
then what you get is you get something that every single step of the ODE solver is now pushing forward what the function would be there. And then what it, what it spits out is the solution to the ODE as a function, which is a, the solution to the PDE. So this is essentially what, what you get out of this is the approx fund type, um, what, what it's doing internally is every single time it does a plus operation, it figures out how many coefficients that the vector should be storing such that it gets machine precision. So it's adaptive in the number of spatial time, time points it's doing. But the ODE solver was an adaptive time ODE solver. So it, is, it builds in itself a method which is both adaptive in space and adaptive in time simultaneously for solving it for, uh, for pseudo-spectral discretization. And it's quite efficient when you do it like this too, because it's also choosing the smallest, uh, you know, the largest step sizes it can and the smallest uh, the number of spatial points that it can. And so it's quite efficient. And the interesting thing is that no one really had to write the full code because it's really all generated by having a function type that represents it in a vector space and get, imbues it with the right algebra and then allowing the differential equation solver to recompile itself on that algebra. And so, you know, while, while this has been a lot about, you know, scientific machine learning, I think that really what's really pushing this, this forward is that composable software is really giving us a tool for going beyond what this handwritten software can achieve. So I think that there's a lot that we can do in this space of scientific machine learning for uncertainty quantification and, and building weird methods for high dimensional partial differential equations, which will be relying on composing our software in ways that are utilizing these kinds of code transformation techniques behind the hood. So automatic differentiation, I think, is just one of what is a whole set or a whole area of code generation techniques for mathematics. Um, and where we're going with this directly is there is a commercial software that we've been building as part of this um, that I've been building as part of uh, my relationship with the University of Maryland uh, School of Pharmacy. And it's what it does is it allows uh, clinical trials to be able to, um, well, it, it, what it does is you're able to analyze clinical trial data with respect to these pharmacometric models. And one of the problems in this domain is that figuring out what the right pharmacometric model is one of the difficult parts, one of the most difficult things that you can do. And uh, by utilizing the same kind of techniques, so like these different, these neural networks and Cindy embedded within uh, these, what are now a nonlinear mix effects model, we're then able